Hey guys, happy Sunday. I'm Yari and welcome to my channel, Manicure and Murder Combos. Today we will chat about serial killer Larry William Eller. But before going into our chat about him, I want to share five tips for those who are tired of biting their nails and want to finally show off those pretty nails. So let's get started. Tip one, take a few minutes every day to rub lotion and cuticle oil of your choice on your hand. Seeing healthy, moisturized skin can deter some from wanting to bite their nails as it is a simple nail care routine. Two, try anti-biting lotions as the taste isn't savory. Three, manicure your short nails. Again, seeing your nails manicured, painted, with, even, with, even if with clear nail polish can inspire some not to bite their nails. Four, Consider press-on nails to give your nails a breather from nail biting. You might bite on the press-on nail, but it won't give off the same satisfying feeling from biting your natural nail. And also, press-on nails will not damage your natural nail, which is a plus. And lastly, either do your own manicure or get one at the nail salon and then carry a file around to smooth away you know, those little edges that might tempt you to bite your nails. I really hope some of these tips help. Um, let me know. So anyway, let's get started on this crazy story. So Larry William Eller was born December 21st, 1952 to Shirley Phyllis Kennedy and George Howard Eller in Crawfordville, Indiana. Larry was the youngest of four. His father, George, was an alcoholic who was known to abuse Shirley and the children. Larry being the youngest and his sister Teresa being the second youngest, they will usually be in the care of babysitters, family, or in foster care due to the abuse and the family's financial disability. Shirley did the best that she could for her family by working two jobs that would prove not to be enough. Due to the similarities in their life, Larry and his sister Teresa would grow up to be close to one another. It is important to note that Shirley did divorce George and went on to remarry four times total, but never for the better. It is said that the abuse escalated to one of Larry's stepfathers submerging his head into hot water as a form of discipline. At the young age of 10 years old, Larry is placed in a home for unruly boys and it goes without question that he isn't happy but begs his mother to discharge him from the home and allow him to return to her house with the promise to behave. Shirley did bring him home but also made appointments for him to be psychologically evaluated which, review, which after review doctors documented that Larry is of average intelligence and suffers from the fear of abandonment due to his life experiences. Shortly after this evaluation, Larry is placed in a Catholic boys home in Fort Wayne. In his early teens, Larry comes to, to the struggling realization that he is a homosexual and develops self-hate about it. He made attempts at dating females, but it didn't change the realization that he had already come to. While in school, Larry deals with other young children bullying him and he makes the decision to drop out of school, but later decides to get his GED and then he also makes an attempt to go to college in the Indiana State University where he meets library science professor Robert David Little, but quickly decides that finding employment is a better fit for him. Larry finds himself working in a shoe store and, it, and as also as a house painter. And with these opportunities, he also starts hanging out in Indianapolis gay community. And it doesn't take long for him to become a familiar face. Um, it isn't long as well that Larry and Professor Robert, we'll just call him Robert moving forward, decide to become roommates. And the two are often seen hanging out in bars due to Robert's not so easy on the eyes as Larry, Larry will often find him gentlemen to engage in sexual activities with Robert. And here's when the story starts to get crazy. On August 3rd, 1978, Larry picks up 19-year-old hitchhiker Craig Long and after a failed attempt at propositioning the young man, Larry becomes upset and threatens Craig with a knife, ordering him to get naked and jump on the back of his truck. Craig is not only threatened, 
but also is also handcuffed and bound at the ankles. While Larry is distracted, removing his own clothes, Craig makes an attempt to get away, prompting Larry to chase him, and when he catches up to him, he stabs Craig in the chest. Craig goes on to play dead, and when Larry is gone, he, you know, Craig has a punctured lung. He makes a dash for a nearby house where the cops are called and medical assistance is also obtained for him. Craig survives this attack and he's able to provide um, information that leads to Larry's arrest. And when Larry is found, he is found with what is indicative of a kidnapping kit or an assault kit. And he's charged with aggravated battery. Larry claims that he stabbed Craig by mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Anyway, at trial, Larry agrees to plead guilty and the judge sets the bond for $10,000, which is paid by Larry's friends who say, hey, Larry's a nice guy. I don't know what you guys are talking about. But anyway, on August 23rd, 1978, the date that Larry is received, Craig is offered $2,500 and say, hey, you know, don't go forward with this case. And Craig, you know, obviously because $2,500 in 1978, he says, okay. And he refuses to press charges and Larry's acquitted and he's only charged $43 in court fees. So 19, um, August 1981 rolls around and Larry, who now works as a house painter in Illinois on weekends and at a liquor store in Indiana on Saturday, begins a relationship with a 20 year old man who is married named John Dabrowski. And he lives with his wife, Sally, their two biological children and three foster children. Sally is aware of her husband's sexual orientation. So she allows this affair to take place and she even allows Larry to move in with them on weekends and Larry helps them pay rent as well. Um, where he lives with them on the weekdays, then on the weekends, he goes and lives with Robert, who's the professor. So anyway, during Larry and John's affair, Larry needs a lot of reassurance that he is the only man in John's life. But a lot of these Discussions lead into physical altercations and basically, you know, he, he beats up Larry often. And a lot of these disputes do stem from Robert being an instigator. So anyway, they're in their relationship. Well, someone, according to Larry, has to pay for this abuse that he's subjected to. And on October 12, 1982, while he's in Indiana, Larry lures the 21-year-old named Craig Townsend. This is not the same Craig that I mentioned in the beginning. Well, anyway, he assaults Craig Townsend to the point that Craig is in a coma. Yet, despite being drugged and stabbed, he survives this. Um, actually, he, he wasn't stabbed. He was just left for drunk and dead and stuff like that. But anyway, he survives. So then 11 days later on October 23rd, 1982, Larry abducts 19-year-old Stephen Croquette, but he will not be so lucky as the Craig and Craig 1 and Craig 2. And 12 hours after he's murdered, he is found in a cornfield. Stephen was beaten and stabbed 32 times about the body and four times on the head. A week later on October 30th, 1982, 26-year-old Edgar Under under Colfer, he will go on to be missing from Illinois and his dead body is found on March 4th, 1983 in another field. About a month later, Larry murders 25 year old named John Johnson and his body is found a month later in Indiana. On December 19, 1982, 23-year-old Stephen Egan was abducted and his body was later discovered on December 28, 1983, close to Indiana State Road 63. Stephen would not only be found, but a canvas of the scene where he was found proved to have human flesh against the wall as well. Stephen had been mutilated, so mutilated that the coroner who exam examined the body reported that he really believes that two people were involved in his murder. That same coroner, after examining Stephen's body, went on to examine the body of a 21-year-old named John Roach, who had been found the same day close to Interstate 70 in Pummel County with very similar injuries. The examiner made sure to mention that there was so much race shown in these two victims by the killer or by more than one killer. On December 30 of 1982, 
22-year-old David Block disappeared from Illinois after telling his family that he was going to visit a friend. But instead, his body was found on May 7, 1984 in a field south of Illinois Route 173. Now on January 24, 1983, Larry, um, he's still on the streak. He abducts 16-year-old Irvin Gibson, whose body isn't found until April 15, 1983, alongside a dog that was stabbed to death. Between March and April 1983, Larry is suspected of killing at least five victims between the ages of 17 to 29. On May 9, 1983, the body of 21-year-old Daniel Scott Naveen is found with his pants pulled down around his ankles, welt marks around the wrist and ankles, his stab wounds to the neck, to the back, to his abdominal area, and he's in a field close to Indiana State Road 39, and it is determined that his murder is linked to many others by the same killer. Nine days later in Illinois, Larry murders 25-year-old Richard Bruce, disposing of his body by throwing it into a creek, but his body isn't found until December 5th, 1983. Alarmed by the countless dead men and after the dead body of Scott Naveen was found, Indiana police conducted a meeting inviting 35 detectives from four jurisdictions where other men were found murdered and it was determined that a pattern exists and that the same person must have been responsible for all the murders. After this meeting birthed a task force named Central Indiana Multiple Agency Investigations Team dedicated to apprehension of the person responsible for these murders. The task force was made up of two detectives from state police, two from Indianapolis, and two from each county. All the, and all the information that they put together was entered into a link database that links to statewide police system. I don't know what system that is, to be honest, but that's what it, that's what I gathered. So anyway, the FBI was contacted and they were provided with the information that this task force had task force had collected. So not that long after, um, Kentucky Police Department contacts the task force and informs them that they have a 29-year-old body of a Jay Reynolds that was discovered stabbed to death in Madison County on March 22nd, and that they believe that that body must have been transported to that site where it was found. Then Chicago PD reported that on May 9th, they found a body of 18-year-old um, Jimmy Robert in Thorn Creek, believing that his murder is probably linked to all the other murders that the task force is investigating. So the task force went on to name this case, well, the perpetrator of this case, the highway murderer. So the FBI, after being provided all this information, they develop a psychological profile predicting that the killer was most likely white in his late 20s or early 30s, who probably worked minimal jobs and probably presented a like a roughly manly man exterior and this is part due to self-hatred regarding his sexual attraction to other men they also shared that the killer most likely freak um fre frequents and this is quote redneck bars and could be a person who is out a lot at nighttime they also believe that the killer in order to feel like less guilty for committing these murders he covers the body after killing them so anyway, June 6th rolls around and a former lover of Larry, whose name is Thomas Henderson, calls the investigation and he's the one who brings Larry into the light of everything. And he basically tells this investigation team that he believes that Larry is behind these murders because he's aware that Larry was once arrested and charged with the stabbing of a hitchhiker in 1978. He also told them that he knows that he once drugged a 14-year-old to check if a, a sedative that he had in hand was effective. He also shared that Larry had a violent temper and that he enjoyed bondage. He ended by sharing where Larry worked on the weekend and obviously where he was staying during the weekend. So following this lead, the investigators obviously do the smart thing. They check Larry's background, his criminal history, and they see that 
Larry was in fact arrested for what Thomas had revealed to them. Um, and looking into the details of the case, they made the observation that Larry's MO fit their current pattern. They also took note that Larry is an avid traveler between Indianapolis and Chicago. However, this new gathering you know, of information was still not enough to place him under arrest or to request that he be put under surveillance 24-7. So then July 2nd, 1984, an, unaden an unidentified man was discovered stabbed numerous times in the abdominal area and he and found in a field two miles from the city of Paxton in Ford County, Illinois. It's believed the victim must have been killed around June 27 or 28. On August 31st, 1984, another body was later identified as 28-year-old Ralph Calise um, and he was found in a field close to a tollway near Illinois, Route 60. And after his body was found, the investigators linked his murder to the stabbing death of, Ir of Irvin Gibson and Gustavo Herrera, who had been discovered in the same area in 1983. After conferral with the police department and the task force on September 8, 1984, investigator investigators linked these deaths to the already existing cases that they were currently working on. Then October 4th, 1984, two mushroom hunters discovered the torso of 18-year-old Eric Hansen, who had last been seen on September 27, 1984. He was not, um, where am I? So anyway, his torso was found in a plastic bag. What was different with this found body was that the limbs were cut off, which wasn't the same as the others. And also his blood had been completely drained out. And that was also different. But anyway, 11 days later, the skeletal remains of a young man were found buried in a field close to Ranzelier, Indiana. I might be saying that wrong. But anyway, it was determined this young man was a Caucasian with reddish brown shoulder length hair. However, he will remain unidentified. On October 18, 1984, four partially decomposed bodies were found alongside an oak tree close to an abandoned farmhouse in Lake Village, Indiana. It was determined that they had all been murdered months ago and had all been stabbed numerous times. On December 7, 1984, 17-year-old Richard Wayne Skeleton was found by a hunter in Hendricks County close to U.S. Route 40. Not too far from Richard's body, another decomposed male was found, and though it was determined that the victim was African-American, measuring approximately 5'9", he will also go as unidentified. So during a routine traffic stop on September 30, 1985, Larry and another male were arrested for solicitating a young male for sexual purposes. Well, only Larry, you know, they brought both of them in, but Larry was the one that was arrested for solicitating a young male for sexual purposes. So during the arrest, Larry's truck was searched and the search produced two nylon ropes, a knife, handcuffs, hammer, baseball bat, a mallet, and surgical tape. Larry's truck was impounded and submitted for evidence collection. During the collection process, which also included inspecting Larry's shoes, it was concluded that not only his shoe prints match a cast already collected from Ralph's crime scene, but that his tire impressions also were also a match. And the knife that was found had traces of blood on it. They also took notice that Larry's profile matched the one given by the FBI. While Larry was being interviewed, he was informed that he was a suspect in the murders that had taken place thanks to an anonymous phone call that they received from a former acquaintance. Larry agreed to answer questions, but none related to his sexuality. Though Larry didn't wish to talk about his sexuality, one investigator did say to them, to him that he knew that he has something to do with the murders and that he believes it has something to do with the you know with the terminus relationship that he's carrying on with john Dabrowski. that comment sparked larry to open up enough to admit that he and john did have a love-hate relationship and that sometimes it leads to him being physically assaulted by john all in all larry denied being involved in any of the murders after the examination of the property larry was told that he was free to go but that he will not be able to take his vehicle. The investigation then proceeded to obtain a warrant to go into Richard Little's home. On October 2nd, the team went 
into Richard's home and conducted a legal search and receipts for the purchases of handcuffs and a knife were found that demonstrated that Larry was present in Illinois and Indiana on dates related to incidents that circled around found victims. During this intense review of phone calls, it was observed and documented that Larry called Richard's home during the time that they suspected the victims were recently killed. Investigators were also able to obtain hospital records that showed that after the murder of Ralph Kalis, Larry had received medical assistance for a deep cut in his hand, which is probably indicative that he had stabbed someone. But of course, Larry made up an excuse explaining his deep laceration. Well, not long after Larry's release, he obtained legal representation from a Chicago lawyer. And that lawyer on October 11 filed a suit against the task force claiming that his client was being harassed and they violated his Fourth Amendment right. He claimed that there was insufficient evidence to formally charge Larry with any murder and that they should not have been able to collect the evidence. And the suit requested $250,000 in compensation. Well, before Larry's lawyer filed the suit, evidence was already had been sent down and that test evidence was enough to link Larry to the murder so much so that they obtained a second warrant to go back to Robert Little's house and found that Larry had a duplicate key of a key that was found under Stephen Egan's body that key was found to fit a door of an office that Larry had worked in in 1982 so October 29 after law enforcement made the determination that they had enough evidence Larry was arrested and formally charged with the death of Ralph Calise and once process his bond was set for one million dollars with this newfound development larry's mother robert little and john drabolski requested that larry be allowed to get a new lawyer that can legally represent him in this criminal matter and a new appoint and appoint a new lawyer which replaced his civil lawyer the new lawyer then proceeded to advise larry not to make any contact with the news media for interviews so during nine december 1983 a judge reviewed all that was presented to him, and he determined that though the car stop was legal, his detention was in fact not a legal detention as there is no probable cause to support the detention, which made it illegal. Larry's lawyer with the judge's statement filed a motion to suppress any evidence that had been collected during the illegal detention. And in 1984, after four days of testimony, it was decided that Larry was only arrested for solicitating a male for sexual purposes and detaining him and collecting certain things was in fact a violation of Larry's fourth amendment right and therefore it was ruled that the collection of certain items was in fact illegal and may not be used against him but the judge did make the determination that the only evidence that will be allowed to be presented during the trial will be that obtained of the tire impression the hair and the blood then Larry's bond was reduced to ten thousand dollars which friends and family collected and paid and Larry was once again released on February 6 1984 with this new ruling, Larry's lawyer filed a motion to the Supreme Court to have the rest of the evidence also suppressed, but that attempt was all, was an unsuccessful one. Free and able to mingle with society, Larry on August 19, 1984, lured 16-year-old Daniel Bridges to his apartment. Daniel, since the age young age of 12, had been a sex worker. Larry knew Daniel because Daniel was a close friend of victim Irvin Gibson. Um, I didn't mention this before. Um, not only was Irvin a victim of Larry, but was also featured in a documentary about child exploitation in America, where he mentions Larry and how he is a real freak who is a well-known male sex worker uptown. So going back to Daniel, he's being tortured, stabbed to death. By the way, this is all happening in the apartment that Larry shares with Richard Little. Daniel was dismembered and his blood had been drained. Then he was placed in six different bags and dumped inside a garbage dump dumpster near Larry's residence. On August 21st, 1984, a janitor while doing his job picks up one of the bags and when he looks inside, he discovers Daniel's body. After the news spread, other work spreads, other workers make the claim that they had witnessed Larry dumping the bags, but at the time they thought it was just garbage. These claims resulted in Larry being immediately arrested. While collecting evidence, law enforcement may notice 
that there was a new paint job in one of the rooms in the apartment, but the paint job was not enough to hide Daniel's blood on the wall, ceiling, floor, on the mattress, on a chair, on a leather belt, on a sofa that was in the room, and lastly, on the floorboard of the bathroom. And inside Larry's closet, Daniel's jeans and t-shirt was also found soaked in Daniel's blood. Forensic evidence team was called in and the apartment lit up like a Christmas tree and the bathtub showed evidence that that is where Daniel was dismembered. And on August 22nd, 1984, Larry is officially charged with the murder of Daniel. Larry, as in the past, denied knowing anything and denied killing Daniel, but his fingerprints were found on the bag that contained Daniel's remains. With this arrest and the evidence collected, this persuaded not only Robert to testify against Larry, but it also prompted John to do the same. John, I mean, Robert, of course, claimed not to be present and testified that. He claimed that he was a tear hot and that he had also made a payment to a tax bill during his outing. Robert was questioned as to why he paid that bill during the time that he did and his response was because he had the funds available and felt like it. Larry's lawyer had claimed Robert only paid that bill because he was trying to establish a valid alibi. Then John testified that Larry didn't allow him to visit him in his apartment, which was unusual. John O also claimed that Larry stated that he was with Robert, which didn't make sense to him because Robert usually returns on Sundays from Tear Hot. He also stated that Larry went to his house instead and bathed there and refused to engage in any sexual activities with him, which made him presume that he was with another man before coming over. Witnesses testified to seeing Larry going up to his storage to collect tools and seeing Larry make trips to the, uh, multiple trips to the, to dump the bags in the dumpster. Other witnesses that included other males Larry had engaged in sexual relations relationships with testified that Larry was abusive during their sexual engagement and that he also was into bonding. Then friends and family testified that Larry was loving, gentle, and caring human being. His mother even went on to mention the abuse that her son had been subjected to during his early years. Larry's lawyer did, did try to argue to the jury that Danny was not kidnapped and that he willingly went into the apartment he also argued that robert was culpable in the murder while the opposing team argued that only larry committed the kidnapping and the murder after three hours of deliberation larry was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping unlawful restraint and murder and concealment of daniel bridges on october 3rd larry was sentenced to death by lethal injection the judge quoted the senseless and barbaric murder of a 16 year old a killing which was so brutal it defies this defies description shows me your complete disregard for human life if there was ever was a person or situation for with the which the death penalty is appropriate it is you you are an evil person you truly deserve to die for your acts i thereby sentence you to death for the murder of danny bridges committed during the course of his aggravated kidnapping larry's lawyer of course appealed claiming that though larry dismembered daniel's body that robert was the actual person who killed daniel but the appeal was denied and an initial execution date was set for march 16. november 1990 a verlamont county prosecutor obtained the physical evidence against against larry that implicated him in the murder of, Ra of ralph the county prosecutor also requested that the previous suppressed evidence be allowed to determine if larry had anything to do with the murder of stephen agin with this request, Larry agreed to confess and implicated Robin participating in his 17-page confession. Larry, of course, was then arrested for Stephen Agin's um, death, and he faced up to 60 years in prison if convicted. But then anyway, they went to trial. Robert was found not guilty. And after he was, with all the evidence presented, it didn't matter. He was still found not guilty. And when they asked Robert, hey, what are you going to do now? He basically states, like, I'm just going to go back into teaching. Um, so anyway, Larry is never executed, but he does die of AIDS-related complications on March 6, 1994, while an appeal was pending to overturn his death sentence because Larry's prior lawyer had received payment of almost over $16,000 from robert which created a conflict of interest though robert still appeared as a witness for the prosecution um anyway um john moved away with his wife after the trial that he testified in and that he died in 1990 away from the aids virus 
But that is what happened. And this story is absolutely crazy. But, you know, but it is what it is. It sucks because I do think that Robert has stuff to do with this. But obviously he was found not guilty. So there's nothing that could be done about that. But anyway, my love, this is all I have for you. I hope you like what i brought you guys um let me know what you think in the comments really quick about these polishes obviously you already know if you've been watching my few videos these are my favorite base coats top coats um op polishes are to me excellent nail polishes um my nails are short here because i had a horrible break so me i hate having different size nails so i just cut them off also if you try the the tips that i gave against nail body let me know if that also works for you i'll look for other tips as well to help those who do bite their nails but if your nails are short just manicure them and make them look pretty look my nails are gorgeous whether they're short they're long so live your best life with long nails short nails you know you do you your nails don't have to be super long but definitely let me know if the tips i gave help and i will definitely like i said look for the tips to help um when doing designs listen just go crazy with the with the brush you'll be surprised how pretty your designs come out um it's not hard at all that's freehand what i do when i do designs where i'm doing flowers and stuff then that's a little more complicated but it's doable you definitely can get it done well loves this is the end of the video like i say say no to murderers yes to murder stories catch you next sunday bye